good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Baker Institute. I have to admit that I had a very malicious thought in one of my darker moments. I was telling our distinguished speakers that I thought of releasing about 25 chickens tonight into the <laughs> audience and see what the reaction would be. Total uh, but total terror. <laughs> welcome to the Baker Institute. We're delighted to have you here. It's a pretty special uh, occasion. The World Health Organization has reported that 133 people have now been stricken by the H5N1 avian influenza virus. More than half the people infected, 68, have died from the disease, which has also resulted in the death or destruction of more than 150 million birds. There has been frequent reference to the last great pandemic that occurred in 1918, when Spanish flu swept the world, killing 40 million people, including more than half a million in the United States. But this has to be put in perspective. 1918 was the last year of World War I and trench warfare, when medical care facilities and global communications were far from what they are today. So we definitely need to avoid hysteria. A pandemic means, means a worldwide epidemic with varying degrees of illness and mortality. A recent report is headlined like flu pandemic could kill 150 million, the United Nations warns, is not helpful, for example. What we need to determine, and this evening's illustrious experts will help us do so, is to obtain insights on the nature and magnitude of the threats we face today and the immediate and long-term options we have in response to the threats. How significant a threat does avian flu pose? What defenses are in place to detect a pandemic, including disease surveillance at home and abroad? What are the implications for the public health systems and our responses to wider biological threats and challenges? How likely is avian flu to become readily communicable between humans? How contagious would it be? What interventions could be taken if it did become a pandemic? And how deadly would it be? Dr. Scott Lillibridge organized a timely and excellent executive education session on pandemic influenza for the city of Houston and Harris County at the beginning of this week at UT's uh, medical school, which Dr. Tripp Cassells and I participated in. Two major themes emerged from my perspective of this excellent and very useful session. First, the need to inculcate a culture of preparedness through public education and media communications so that people can learn what they need to know to prevent this illness and what resources are available for treatment. Second is the concept of the realm of the possible. What can we do with what we have to minimize the spread of infection until we have a vaccine. These and other issues will be discussed this evening. It is now my honor to introduce our distinguished moderator, Dr. Lillibridge, and our distinguished speakers, Dr. Trip Cassells and Dr. Eric Noji. You have their biographies in the programs. I am not going to go into detail and uh, repeat all there, but I do want to touch on certain highlights. Uh, Scott Lillibridge is a professor of uh, epidemiology, I can never pronounce that word, <laughs> epidemiology, and director for the Center for Biosecurity and Public Health Preparedness at the UT School of Public Health at Houston. Uh, he has held very high positions with the uh, Secretary of Health, uh, Tommy Thompson, a special assistant for national security and emergency management. Uh, during a time when the nation was experiencing anthrax attacks. He was heavily involved in that in, in October 2001. He founding director of the Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Program at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, he has been involved in the responses in the Oklahoma City bombing and in Tokyo in the sarin terrorist attack in the Tokyo subway system. 
uh, in uh, uh, 1995. Uh, he's worked in emergency response and preparedness roles throughout the world in support of the U.S. government and non-governmental organizations. He was appointed by President George W. Bush to the White House Emergency Services, Law Enforcement and Public Health uh, Senior, Adv Senior Advisory Committee for Homeland Security. Uh, he is extremely and abundantly well uh, experienced and qualified in these issues. Dr. Ward Cassell, Cassells uh, joined the University of Texas at Houston in 1992 after uh, minor educational stints at Yale and Harvard Medical School. Uh, he uh, established the President Bush Center for Cardiovascular Health in 1997. He's Professor of Public Health and Vice President for Biotechnology. In 2004, uh, the Texas Heart Institute named him Director of Clinical Research. He was the first to identify influenza as a cause of heart attacks and as a potential weapon of uh, bioterrorism. In 2004, uh, Tripp Cassells established the Nano Health Alliance with Rice University, UT MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, Baylor College of Medicine, and the University of Houston. Uh, he led in this year, early this year, he led a UT disaster team assisting tsunami relief and recovery efforts in Thailand and Indonesia. And most recently, he joined the Army and uh, is a colonel mobilized by the Office of the U.S. Army Surgeon General and has been doing some very important work and most recently was awarded the Army M Meritorious Service Medal for his uh, service during uh, Iraqi Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, we're also delighted to have Dr. Eric Noji. Uh, he's a physician serving as a senior policy advisor to the director of the CDC in Washington, responsible for working with Congress, the White House, and other executive branch agencies on issues related to health and medical threats to national uh, security. He also was assigned to the White House uh, Homeland Security in the Executive Office of the President as an expert in the treatment of biological, chemical, and blast terrorism and continues to serve as Special Assistant to the U.S. Surgeon General for Homeland uh, Security. He has extensive domestic and international experience in responding to natural and technological disasters, terrorism, wars and other humanitarian uh, crises. He was awarded the Woodrow Wilson uh, Award for Distinguished Government Service and was just recently elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. So you can see that we have truly an old star uh, group of experts to educate us on this very important and timely issue. I now my pleasure to ask them to come to the table and uh, for Scott Lillibridge to uh, moderate this session. Okay. Can you hear me in the back there? Great. Uh, I'm Scott Lillibridge and I it's hard to follow up on an introduction like that. Um, Ambassador Derigen leaves a few stones unturned when he makes an introduction or uh, brings up a new point. I am honored today to uh, be flanked by two of my close friends and associates here and um, thankful to be in the Baker Institute and thanks for your patronage with our projects around town and your leadership, Ambassador Derigen. I would like to briefly uh, introduce these two in sequence uh, as they get into the mainstream of their talk tonight. And, uh, but uh, you have their bio. I want to tell you what's not in their bio. I, I have been doing some investigative reporting. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sorry, but I, I think that uh, it's high time that these issues came to light. <laughs> Let me start first with Dr. Tripp Cassells, who will be speaking on the topic of avian influenza. Um, we know about his educational background. Um, double Ivy League uh, cardiologist, uh, came to the uh, medical center in the uh, early 90s, has had a distinguished career in medicine. But let me tell you about the other things that you don't know about. Um, one, uh, Dr. Tripp Cassells is a visionary. Uh, many people back in the 1830s could see uh, this part, <laughs> the, this part, uh, up to, you know, what is Texas as uh, potentially a republic and uh, ultimately a part of the United States. 
<laughs> people like that uh, are rare. So let me tell you when I first met him. Um, the height of the anthrax attacks, I'm working with the secretary, and uh, it's, uh, we get stacks of phone calls, and uh, depending on uh, how you, you sort of rank in the, uh, the cabinet, uh, you kind of, uh, they move down through the assistant secretaries and the messages are, are uh, passed down. So um, I got my stack of messages around midnight, so you can imagine where I must have ranked. And so I started returning phone calls, uh, you know, from the day. And this was an emergency, so you don't know if these are all emergency contacts or uh, reports. Uh, this is a national emergency on anthrax. Uh, post offices are closed. Um, transportation has taken a hit. Uh, you know, the republic is being challenged. We don't know if there's more attacks coming or going at this point in time. The lab work is coming in. It's confusing. And I get this one little pink sheet of paper. It says, Trip Cassells, call me. So I call, and I thought, well, I'll call and leave a message. Nobody's going to answer a phone at midnight. Well, I call, and uh, Trip Cassells answers the phone, and we start talking. And uh, basically, I hear is, I, you know, I'm from Texas, and I want to make a difference. And uh, how can we help down at the University of Texas? And they talked about the capacity of the medical center, the laboratory background, the uh, resolve of the, uh, the University of Texas, the partners at Rice and University of Houston, and uh, great medical uh, capacities down here. And I said, you know, I think you better come up to Washington. When could you come? And he thought, well, what time tomorrow would be good? And so, uh, to make a long story short, uh, we started a dialogue that brought Dr. Willerson up and uh, established a, a robust dialogue with the policy units of uh, health and human services. And ultimately, uh, I ended up, uh, uh, I guess, who swallowed who? I ended up in Texas. So uh, here I am uh, working at the University of Texas, and uh, it's a delight to work with him. Now, what's it like working with Trip Cassells? Well, um, let me tell you, um, when you get a new job, I want you to check those extra duties as a sign. Read the, read the fine print, because uh, my dear fellow here, uh, who uh, mentors me and helps me along, says, uh, you know, there's been a bad tsunami in uh, the Indian Ocean. I think we're going to be going. We volunteered to the White House, uh, UT's best and brightest, and uh, they weren't available, so, I, I, <laughs> so we're going to go. And, um, and the way you understand it is that uh, we're going to go over, and um, you'll go first, and we'll be. <laughs> and uh, you know, when I'm on travel, I come back, and I hear this, and I, you know, I said, you know, I've hung up my spurs in the State Department and the ATA a long time ago, Trip. And uh, he says, it's easy work. It's liaison job in Bangkok, Thailand, between the U.S. government and the United Nations. Stay in a fancy hotel, you know, three meals a day, big expense account, uh, you know, a lot of uh, high, you know, high rollers working with uh, policy issues and making a difference. And I thought, well, this sounds pretty good. This is not so bad. They're hard to complain about all these people suffering. And uh, I, I'm going to get a policy job finally, a liaison. Well, don't you believe it. I got. I got no further than uh, you know, Southeast Asia, and I was put on a cargo plane, sent to Banda Aceh, landed on the beach, <laughs> and for the next few weeks, I led, uh, participated in a World Health Assessment on the ground, uh, doing what I always did was rapid assessment of disaster-stricken populations <clears throat> to set the priorities for those. Uh, he did follow and did have a liaison job in Bangkok, <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. So without further ado, uh, my dear friend, uh, Trip Cassells, who was uh, among the first to recognize the potential for avian influenza as being uh, a major threat to the public health and medical community, its potential as a bioterrorism weapon, and a visionary about uh, the fact we need to get prepared, both in the civilian, uh, in the business community, and in the medical profession. Um, Trip Cassells saw it first. I'm proud to announce, uh, say I know you, and uh, turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I hope that uh, you recant some of those words if they put me in charge of rationing flu shots. <laughs> I got an invitation to speak today, the most unusual uh, invitation I've had, and this was, was from Algeria. Uh, and uh, it, it said, uh, uh, esteemed sir, we have need of your gaudiness. <laughs> I, but, Maybe, maybe it was for you, Scott. <laughs> I, I think that was a compliment. I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I. Um, this 
pandemic flu problem is one that we have been working on since 1999. And at that time, we uh, already had a program in anthrax at the University of Texas. And it's really the, uh, a credit to the vision of Jim Willerson, the president, and Dr. Red Duke, that we had a strong focus on emergency care and uh, not only the rescue of the individual patient who'd had a, uh, a heart attack or a motor vehicle accident or a shooting, uh, but uh, patients with infections. So we've been at it a while, and we've been publishing in this area, and that's why uh, someone who is uh, uh, a cardiologist, uh, as I am, primarily uh, we come in two flavors, plumbers and electricians, uh, nevertheless has got, gotten interested in uh, this influenza issue because it really is a, uh, a big risk and it's one that we would have a uh, little concern about had we gotten started on it earlier. And I think Dr. Noji will, will look into that. We'll talk about those policy issues. In the interest of time, let me just talk about what you need to know to take care of yourselves. And I'll speak to you just as though uh, you were one of my patients uh, calling up for Tamiflu. Uh, Ed, I'm sorry if, if, if all the ones who had called me for Tamiflu weren't sitting at home happily nursing their horde of Tamiflu, why you would have had an overflow audience tonight. <laughs> because there are, I have written hundreds and hundreds of prescriptions for Tamiflu uh, this year, and uh, I'm glad I've done it. Dr. Noji may take exception because the World Health Authorities typically frown on physicians uh, providing uh, Tamiflu to uh, patients in advance, they say there's a shortage, to which I say, let the pharmacies run out, the pharmaceutical companies will find a way to ramp up production. But we have this, this is one of the many debates in this area about uh, pandemic flu planning. The uh, issues are uh, really daunting now, and having just uh, served as the uh, U.S. Army uh, pandemic flu lead for the last four months, uh, five months now, I can tell you we uh, are really scrambling. We do not have uh, the vaccines we would like. Uh, in the whole country, we have uh, 2.7 million doses of a vaccine which may prevent the flu but we don't know that it will work. We have to take a guess when we formulate these vaccines, and by the time the real pandemic comes, which is a 50-50 chance in the next five years, we may uh, find that our vaccine is not very effective. The average flu vaccine works for uh, somewhere between one-third and two-thirds two of the people who get it. And we all know people who said, I'm not getting that shot again. It gave me the flu last time. Well, we give it at the onset of flu season, and some, and some people it doesn't work. And, and then they uh, uh, turn around and say that the flu shot gave them the flu. And that's an issue because we've got a lot of people who won't take it. We've got a lot of uh, physicians and nurses who haven't had it. And that is inexcusable. And I'll put it to Dr. Noji to ask this policy question. Should a doctor or nurse be able to renew their license if they haven't had the flu shot? Should a hospital where more than half the doctors haven't gotten the shot and where studies show about half of them wash their hands half the time, should that kind of hospital get accredited? And do we even know which hospitals they are? This is a, an unfortunate uh, state of events that we're in. And uh, because government has not solved all these problems, local, state, and federal government agencies, and the pharmaceutical industry, you have to prepare yourselves and your families and your workplaces. All of you spend time at home. Some of you also spend time at an office. And all of you are in contact with the public. The public with which you're in contact is, in many cases, just come back from Bangkok or China or Vietnam. Tomorrow we meet with a visiting Chinese delegation. 
Roxanne and I were there just a few weeks ago and then in Bangkok. So we are prime candidates to, to spread the disease. Uh, please, if I reach for your hand this evening, just uh, wave at me or, uh, or give the Thai uh, uh, the Buddha salute because this is uh, where we are right now. We're in flu season. There's a shortage of vaccines. As a uh, healthy physician, I've not had mine yet. When the, when the patients have, have gotten vaccinated, uh, then I will get uh, my shot, hope to, in the next few weeks. Uh, right now, I'm relying on a heck of a lot of hand washing. I carry wipes with me and Purell lotion. I recommend all my patients do the same. I travel with Tamiflu. I hope you have some. Uh, we estimate, uh, and I, we have an expert here, Dr. Mohammed Majid has done a lot of studies on this. Mohammed, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Tamiflu doesn't just shorten the illness, but it actually, we think it reduces mortality. Is that right? By 40% or so? Is that correct? Exactly. So, uh, uh, Dr. Majid, uh, I'm proud to say, is developing novel antivirals, uh, screening compounds that are uh, already FDA approved because, you know, since we're not going to have a vaccine for H5N1 this year and maybe not next year, we need to have uh, uh, medications which are, uh, uh, can be readily approved by the Food and Drug Administration or that are already approved for a different use. And uh, this young genius, Dr. Majid, is, uh, will soon announce a medication that, at least in uh, uh, experiments, uh, non-human studies, uh, seems to work and it's uh, FDA approved for a different use. So we're terribly excited about that. And that is uh, done, I must say, done with a grant that we would not have gotten but for uh, wonderful help from Senator Hutchison and, and Congressman Tom DeLay. They made that high-risk research possible at a time when NIH was not interested in influenza. NIH in 2004 put $158,600 of research into uh, uh, HIV AIDS on a per death basis, per American deaths. Take the total number of American deaths due to HIV that year and divide them into the NIH research budget for HIV, you get a figure of $158,000 and change. The flu research that year was uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mohammed, $300 on a per death basis. The Bush administration has doubled it and doubled it again, but we're still way behind, uh, and we need an enormous catch up effort uh, in the research. This flu uh, pandemic right now, uh, I, I've done a little survey of experts. We give it about a 10% chance of having a pandemic this year. And uh, double that the following year and double it the following year. So we estimate that in the next five years, there's about a 50% chance of a pandemic, either a mild one, one million deaths, or, an, or a uh, terrible pandemic, order of 150 million deaths. In 1918, when our soldiers came back from Europe, they uh, carried a flu, which they transmitted to each other and packed in uh, train cars and then packed in ships and then living together in close quarters in barracks, living in trenches in World War I, terrible conditions, poorly nourished and so forth. And yet there are parts of the world uh, today that are at war and that have these conditions that are ripe for this sort of uh, bug to develop. Uh, and in 1918, the flu moved so quickly that in the month of October, the mortality of American soldiers increased by a factor of 20 in the month of October 1918, a 20-fold increase in, in deaths, hundreds of thousands killed. We lost more soldiers to, to uh, influenza in 1918 than we lost to combat casualties, uh, almost twice as many. And that's the concern that now we have a flu which looks very much like that flu in terms of its genetic sequence. 
But even more ominously, instead of killing 5% of the victims, it's killing 52% of the victims. We now have this disease in 18 countries, including several in Europe, Croatia, Macedonia, Greece, Romania. And if it comes down with the birds into Africa, where people are, many of them have HIV, they're immunocompromised, they have tuberculosis, uh, many are not well nourished, then it will uh, spread like a brush fire in Africa. The conditions that have made this possible include unprecedented airline travel, and airlines are a risk, but particularly in South Asia, we now have a mixing of uh, ducks and chickens and pigs like we never had before, and particularly in South China in the wet markets. We have now 1,000 times more poultry than China had in 1958, uh, the last severe pandemic. We have 1,000 times more poultry. We have 500 times more pigs in China than we had, and they're all in there together. And one of the concerns that Dr. Lillibridge and I had in the tsunami was that when we got to the refugee camps, we saw children with the, the uh, one or two of the family, um, the family duck and a family chicken, and uh, the other child was huddled there with the family piglets, which is an absolute uh, uh, prescription. Uh, uh, crowded conditions, animals crowded together, people crowded together. So we really have a, a, a problem. The flu over there now is resistant to romantidine and amantadine. Uh, there's growing resistance to uh, Tamiflu. Uh, we hope it will respond to a related drug called Relenza. And now we're beginning to see clusters of human-to-human -human transmission. So the, the, the setup is there. And uh, if we're lucky and the pandemic really strikes in four or five years, we'll be prepared because the government is now aware of it. They're playing catch up. And uh, I think we have a, uh, a shot at it. If it happens in the next two years, you're really going to have to rely on uh, a 19th century medicine. S businesses will shut down, people will stay home. If you have s multiple rooms in the house, people will, you'll have to isolate the sick people alone. It's tough. Children have to be told they can't get in bed with their parents when they're sick. You don't want to go in the room. You'll stand outside the door and offer consoling words. Um, Travel will come to an abrupt end. Doctors, many doctors will not report to the hospitals. Many police uh, and EMS crews will not report, as we learned in New Orleans, uh, unless, uh, <laughs> unless uh, uh, FEMA has undergone a, uh, an extensive makeover we will not uh, see much government, much federal government help for a while. And there's a, a significant uh, opportunity for, uh, for uh, public disorder. So the message that I'm giving to my patients is not a very cheery message. It's really a message focused on, on hand washing and uh, vigilance, being ready to uh, isolate oneself and one's family, and uh, to have a plan, a family plan, a business plan, a community plan, and the government can't give you those plans. We, uh, we can give you guidelines, and we, we, we do this type of consulting to give people guidelines on what their plan should contain, but it has to be individualized to your type of business, your family, your, uh, your location. So these are uh, these are issues of grave concern. When, when, when we were children, we said a prayer that we never say anymore. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It was influenza that killed in 24 hours and led to prayers such as this. Influenza pneumonia in 1918 killed on average within 48 hours. And children were the biggest, uh, children and young adults were the main victims. 
and they would go, to, many went to bed with a cold or a fever and didn't wake up or woke up to suffocate to, to death. And this is where this prayer uh, became, when, when it came into widespread use. Antibiotics and improved hygiene have given us confidence uh, because infectious diseases have waned. Now they're making a tremendous comeback because of these uh, conditions I alluded to before. And we are not an island. We have to be as engaged as we are in any form of terrorism because we cannot protect ourselves, even with hand washing, from a death which comes in the air. If it comes in birds that fly over from <coughs> Siberia or from tourists or troops who fly back from Asia and it's transmitted by cough and sneeze, no amount of hand washing uh, will, will protect you. Hence the strategy that we are working on within our university, within our city, and uh, grateful to have Ambassador DeRigian taking the same role in this that he did with uh, uh, from the beginning of the uh, homeland security issues here, the anthrax crisis and the terrorist bombings. The issue is that we have to detect these things early. And we have developed at the University of Texas a radically new form of, uh, of surveillance for this disease, uh, thanks to uh, uh, a guy named Parsamir Haji, which the Defense Department is now adopting, the city of Houston has adopted, we think the state of Texas will adopt it, which will enable us to find a small focus, a brush fire, and extinguish it by the use of antiviral drugs before it spreads. But if it spreads beyond that, we don't have enough Tamiflu, and, and we will never, uh, in the next three years, have enough uh, vaccine, even if it is efficacious. So there are a lot of ifs. And uh, I wish I could uh, deliver a, uh, a cheerier message to this than this, but the fact that you're here and that you're hearing it and that you, you will be vigilant is critical. And if it never comes, uh, obviously there will be a, a public health triumph. That's the best of all if we prepare for it and spend a few billion dollars, just as we have fire extinguishers in our house, we have seat belts in our cars, and yet not one of us really expects to have a car crash this year or to have a fire break out in our house this year, but we take those precautions. We're going to have to learn to do that uh, with this issue and uh, focus some resources, and they have to come from other areas, areas like cardiac catheterization, things that uh, we cardiologists are fond of, but there has to be a reallocation of resources because this is a, uh, uh, a national and global uh, public health emergency. And it's going to require unprecedented government agency cooperation, unprecedented international diplomacy. It's underway, but uh, there's a very long way to go yet. And, uh, uh, but uh, since I have no answers, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Noji in hopes that uh, he has the answers. Uh, but I want to thank you for your interest in this and your support of this wonderful uh, Baker Institute at Rice, which has done so much to, to uh, bring these uh, issues before the public. We are developing at the University of Texas what I believe will be the premier uh, disaster medicine group, the premier uh, public health uh, school, the premier disease surveillance programs, and the premier influenza efforts in collaboration with Baylor and UTMB and Rice. So uh, the work is underway. It will need uh, uh, all the help that, that you all can give. Uh, you, particularly, many, many of you have been generous supporters of, of Rice and the Medical Center. We hope you will uh, uh, continue to be interested in this issue because Dr. Willerson will soon announce an effort to, uh, to engage public support uh, for this effort at the University of Texas. Ambassador Dridgen, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here with the real expert, Dr. Noji, the last time I saw him, it was on a television. He was lecturing to three million people when he accepted the Laporte Award at the University of Texas. They announced uh, that the webcast was being seen by a record for an academic lecture, 
three million people. Dr. Nozzi, we don't have three million here tonight, but the people we have, I guarantee you, are just as smart, more generous, and uh, just as interested in what you have to, as in what you have to say. Thanks. Well, thank you. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to hold questions till Dr. Noji speaks and uh, get started quickly. Let me mention a few things about Dr. Noji. Um, you can read the bio, uh, of course, in your handout. But let me tell you uh, a little more about this man in a three-dimensional sense. Um, I've had the pleasure to work for Dr. Noji several times, and he's had the pleasure or displeasure to work for me several times in our careers as we've rotated up and down the... Uh, the pyramid at CDC and HHS. Um, as you can see from the bio, he's well-educated. Stanford, University of Chicago, Hopkins. But um, my real experience comes with uh, Dr. Noji when we were both put in the uh, growing disaster unit at CDC, which was uh, developed um, to begin to get a professional cadre of health officers who would go anywhere and do anything um, related to emergencies that are, is to help stricken populations. Uh, most of that was in war zones and so forth. My uh, Southeast Asian story, like with Tripp, uh, uh, also uh, happened uh, with Dr. Noji in a similar fashion. I was in Bombay, or Mumbai, and uh, on the day they had uh, 12 um, uh, bombings uh, of commercial buildings, banks, and so forth. And um, there was some concern that this was the beginning of a uh, terrorist campaign. There was um, quite a bit of panic of the foreign community. A lot of people were leaving. Um, it could have been the start of another Pakistan-India war. There was just tremendous misinformation at that time. Uh, we were due to leave the town that day to go back to uh, Atlanta. So needless to say, when we got to the airport, uh, Dr. Noji, my supervisor, uh, said he would handle the tickets and reservations uh, for us. And uh, this was a mob scene like Gone with the Wind. There was just thousands of people all trying to get out of town that day and uh, jump ahead of the line. and. And um, so I waited patiently, and uh, Dr. Noji went up and uh, did our business for us and came back and informed me that uh, it looked like one of us would be going back to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it wouldn't be me. And, uh, but he gave me some advice. He says, listen, you know, as your supervisor, I want to get straight with you. I, I want you to try to focus on this. Try and save yourself. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> and uh, actually... Uh, uh, I suddenly uh, uh, also ended up in the same plane, but uh, at any rate, uh, he's visionary also. Uh, let me tell you that, <laughs> let, clairvoyant, if you might even add, uh, who would have known it would have been him that got the ticket? Well, uh, Dr. Doji's had 200 publications, been the father of disaster medicine in uh, a number of venues. Johns Hopkins, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, has uh, worked at WHO in uh, Geneva and is the most prolific writer and researcher in the field of disaster medicine. Uh, he has uh, maintained uh, dual boards in both emergency medicine and several other specialties, uh, published uh, scads of textbooks, and uh, as a researcher is un uh, sort of unexcelled in productivity. Um, he has solicited on boards, was recently awarded the Institute of Medicine. Uh, he was inducted into the Institute of Medicine, a tremendous honor for physicians. And with that, let me uh, turn the podium over to him, if you're ready to go. And uh, if somebody could give him a little technical assistance, um, he'll talk about health and security and uh, his perspectives from uh, the White House, HHS Secretary's Office, and with the uh, senior echelons of CDC. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, uh, Ambassador Drudgeon, uh, for inviting me to this absolutely beautiful uh, uh, facility here at the uh, James A. Baker uh, Institute for uh, Public Diplomacy. Uh, before I, I actually get into the meat of my discussion, I think I feel compelled to answer uh, some of uh, Dr. Lillybridge's uh, <laughs> um, comments. Uh, actually, uh, what he said was true. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he doesn't... Uh, uh, huh. Uh, elaborate that that is a very common method of medical education. <laughs> that when we are interns uh, on the very first day, you're just thrown into uh, the the mix, into a very busy emergency room, and you're told to uh, get you either uh, you know uh, uh, 
uh, survive or uh, uh, you uh, you don't. Uh, it's <laughs> it's uh, and so I, I I was actually doing it for uh, Dr. Lilybridge. I just hired him at Nurturing CDC. Nurturing environment, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, maybe a year before, and uh, this was my first opportunity to. Uh, 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 show what a, a fine teacher I was, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, many times I'm uh, congratulated uh, for hiring Scott, and other times, uh, well, we won't go into that, but I must say that uh, uh, I do have, uh, what's it now, 32 days, 16 hours, 8 minutes left uh, as a CDC uh, employee before retirement, but I promise uh, at my uh, uh, going away uh, presentation that I'll include all of my uh, slides of Dr. Lillybridge's distinguished career <laughs> at uh, CDC, uh, both as my boss and as my, uh, my employee. But uh, one thing that uh, I would like to discuss now getting uh, getting back to a serious topic, as uh, Dr. Uh, Cassells mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Cassells mentioned the very major challenges we face as individual uh, citizens uh, being in Washington and being in this forum with uh, uh, world experts in the area of international diplomacy, uh, public diplomacy, international relations, uh, uh, particularly since uh, one of uh, uh, a person who respects uh, Ambassador Dredgen very much, uh, I was at a press conference where I think the only person Karen Hughes actually uh, uh, mentioned publicly was uh, Ambassador Dredgen. She was appointed uh, recently uh, the Undersecretary of State for what we call public diplomacy, uh, where U.S., I won't read that, but basically uh, uh, probably with a focus on the Middle East, uh, there are many countries that, uh, well, bluntly don't like us, and uh, simply killing uh, suicide terrorists, we could do this for the next 20 years, and it's certainly not going to solve the problem. It's uh, it's going to take a much uh, more concerted effort to that, uh, basically improving our, uh, our image in many of these countries. I had actually been introduced to that by Karen when I worked for her uh, in the White House uh, just after uh, 11 September 2001 in uh, beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom. And uh, we were trying to emphasize uh, positive uh, aspects of American life, American society. What are the great achievements uh, that this country has, uh, has uh, provided over uh, this century? And uh, I was uh, uh, probably uh, being a physician, uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, well, you know, medicine. What country has uh, provided uh, the greatest achievements over the last uh, 50, 60 years, the most Nobel Prize winners? Uh, we've had major international programs on bringing medical care, water, sanitation, uh, the Peace Corps. Uh, there have been uh, bills that have been introduced most recently by Senator Frist to establish a global health corps. Uh, our, uh, both uh, Scott and my uh, ex-boss, Governor uh, Secretary Tommy Thompson, said the uh, principle at the heart of what I call medical diplomacy, I, I look upon that as part of public diplomacy, the winning of hearts and minds of people in the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and elsewhere by exporting medical care expertise and personnel to help those who need it most. Medical diplomacy must be made a significantly larger part of our foreign and uh, defense uh, uh, policy. Now, I was also at a recent uh, excellent uh, symposium by uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, who further uh, strengthened this. Uh, 
uh, but also, uh, which is a great concern to me, because we also have major problems with our uh, health care system uh, in this country, uh, issues of uh, financing of health care, uh, the growing expense of health care, and actually, I was very impressed by his comments uh, that there's much of what we can do to improve health care in this country by simply using existing technology. That we don't have to invent uh, new uh, uh, cures, new uh, equipment, but by simply uh, uh, digitizing uh, medical records, uh, improving the efficiency of our care. And uh, uh, Newt mentions. Uh, but is the American system of health care still the modern, the model for uh, modern medicine? And this was my thought was, uh, you know, can we really, can we incorporate uh, all of the wonderful things that this country represents, their contributions in public health and medicine? And uh, this was really uh, both uh, rather depressing to me. Uh, transformation of the American health care system will depend on prevention not a well-funded uh, part of our uh, uh, health care uh, uh, system right now, uh, which is, as, as uh, uh, Speaker Gingrich said, not a cornerstone of the current system. Technology, existing technology, could be the cornerstone of accessibility, affordability, and, uh, and quality. We come now to uh, avian uh, influenza. Of course, uh, in journals which all three of us, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Gassels and Dr. Lilybridge read, I mean, we've been reading about avian influenza, its threats to national security for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, but what are the challenges for global diplomacy, public diplomacy, medical diplomacy? Uh, when we look at, in the past, what have we provided uh, as examples of uh, the strength, the achievements of American medicine, building a hospital, building uh, a University of uh, Texas, an MD Anderson in uh, Kabul, or other countries, something very, very tangible that we can see, uh, medical uh, stockpiles of, of drugs, but here we have uh, probably one of the greatest uh, homeland security and national security threats uh, to this country where uh, if we try to think of, well, how can we use this as, uh, as an example of improving our image uh, overseas? Absolutely critical. Uh, but using methods which uh, are not easily observed or appreciated by uh, other people, both in this country and overseas. Uh, over the last uh, five months, I've grown even more concerned uh, uh, that uh, the issues of avian influenza, which had only been in medical journals, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, but here now it's showing up in some of the more prestigious general uh, scientific uh, journals like uh, like Nature, which probably uh, along with Science are uh, two of the most prestigious scientific general scientific journals. This really hit me. Uh, I don't think I've seen in a journal dealing with uh, foreign affairs, foreign policy, uh, a whole issue devoted to uh, the next pandemic. Uh, special sections, a large part of it devoted uh, in foreign affairs to the national security threats of disease. Uh, Sam Nunn several years ago had uh, had uh, uh, shown great foresight in, uh, in identifying uh, flu, uh, uh, other diseases that could be spread overseas by, our, uh, by transportation, our smaller world. But uh, I guess what was very frustrating to me is in 2000, there was a landmark report 
that was uh, written by the National Intelligence Council, uh, presented to the National uh, Security uh, uh, Council. Uh, it was titled "Disease as a Foreign Sec as a National Security Threat." That's just five years ago. Uh, I went back uh, probably uh, six months ago to tr give a presentation on the growing threat of both uh, bioterrorism and uh, naturally occurring diseases like SARS, uh, like avian influenza, <coughs> and was pretty much blunt bluntly told that. Uh, this is not a national security threat. This is a homeland security threat uh, because there are no physicians. There are no experts in health care in the NSC. And all that was in, uh, in the Homeland Security Council, which uh, was just about to disband their health uh, unit that dealt with uh, these sorts of problems, uh, primarily up until that point of time on bioterrorism. But uh, you know, very, very much of a, uh, of, of a concern. Uh, another major uh, issue is uh, uh, if we look at uh, diplomacy and the importance of fighting this uh, great threat to, I mean, national survival in many, uh, uh, in the estimation of uh, very uh, fine and reputed scientists. Uh, maximizing NATO for the war on terror. Presidential leadership can strengthen the transatlantic relationship by defining and pursuing shared homeland security interest. This uh, 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 seminar was devoted to uh, disease threats, uh, risk assessment and risk communication in uh, bioterrorism, NATO, working with the European Union and really not coordinating very well on this threat with uh, all of the efforts ongoing uh, in this country by our uh, White House, by the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, by the military. Here we have uh, a conference I attended in, in Israel. Uh, how do we uh, uh, communicate to the community what we can do, what's the best thing to do, as many of the things that uh, Dr. Cassells mentioned. Because to be blunt, uh, after 9-11 and the release of anthrax, uh, those of us at CDC, and like uh, Dr. Lillybridge, I was working in Washington with him, you know, we, we could have done a much better job, bluntly, of, of communicating to the public the threats, the changing risk to the public. Uh, and we learned, uh, we learned quite a bit, but uh, here we are uh, in a type of national threat with internationally, and here we have an invisible threat crossing borders uh, uh, with very little communication with uh, major partners. Uh, now this was uh, punctuated by successes. Uh, I worked uh, in Athens uh, during last uh, summer's Olympics two summers ago, Olympic Games, with uh, a very, very good cooperation between Greek authorities, uh, the International uh, Olympic Committee. Uh, this is a GAO report. U.S. support to Athens Games provides lessons for future Olympics. But I also, in re reviewing this report very closely, uh, I felt that there were also important lessons for working with the United Nations and other countries and partners and allies in addressing this, uh, this growing threat, uh, which hopefully, knock on wood, will not be as, uh, as uh, virulent uh, and as uh, destructive as, uh, as we think. Now, traditional US medical aid. Uh, this is where you know, I find, uh, when I think of my interest in public diplomacy, increasing and improving our image. Uh, in most uh, emergencies and disasters that both uh, Dr. Lillybridge and I have worked in, American medical assistance has been very tangible, uh, bringing food, water, shelter, uh, drugs, uh, supplies, medical equipment, uh, medical personnel. I mean, it's great to see teams of uh, American volunteer doctors and nurses are going to uh, 
uh, Phuket or Sri Lanka or Sumatra after uh, the tsunami, and then uh, building uh, building hospitals, uh, uh, all very 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 admirable, but. Uh, None of those uh, very effective against the type of uh, threat that we now face uh, in terms of uh, diseases like SARS and avian influenza. Like uh, Dr. Uh, Cassells mentions, we don't have a drug. Uh, even if uh, we had uh, a cure, a 100% cure for avian influenza right now, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is the U.S. government, we don't have the manufacturing capacity. We do not mass produce things. If you look at World War II, did the U.S. government mass produce planes and tanks? No, it was the private sector that did that. Uh, we can have a, a cure, uh, but we, we just can't mass produce it uh, for the American people. Uh, we don't have a, a vaccine. Uh, at this point in time that uh, could be effective uh, against uh, H5N1, in other words, uh, bird flu. Uh, here we have the, the issue of risk communication. Uh, many people, uh, including my parents, uh, they got their uh, regular flu shot and now they think that they're uh, immune to uh, influenza, including uh, avian influenza. Uh, very, very difficult. Uh, public relations uh, and risk communications, but uh, I swear, I mean, uh, relatives, uh, fortunately, even health, some healthcare workers uh, think that if they get the flu shot now, they'll be immune to uh, avian uh, influenza, when in fact, I'm the only person who's immunized. I'm just joking. Uh, uh, once again, uh, uh, we've depended uh, uh, in a lot of our foreign aid uh, very effectively uh, by uh, by uh, bringing in bringing in food, uh, uh, lots of the other uh, materials. This is uh, when I worked in Liberia and Sierra Leone during the Civil War. Uh, USAID and its operational arm, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. Uh, most of the materiel, food. This happens to be uh, cooking oil. Uh, from uh, the U.S. government, uh, very, very tangible evidence of America's concern uh, for the victims of, uh, of a disaster like a tsunami or the Pakistan earthquake or the earthquake in Iran a few years ago. Uh, worked in, uh, uh, after the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in uh, 1991. And once again, you know, we built uh, temporary camps and, uh, and clinics. Uh, uh, thank you to the uh, Philippine Department of Health uh, Foundations and the uh, United States Agency for International Development. Um, but uh, like I said before, uh, our planning for bird flu or any pandemic uh, disease, I mean, this has been going on now four years, and it's uh, dependent on the classic American research paradigm. Uh, basic research, uh, what is the fundamental nature of that disease, uh, developing countermeasures, uh, might take uh, five or six trials before we actually come up with uh, a drug effective against uh, avian influenza. We're nowhere near that point right now. Uh, we don't have a drug. We don't have a vaccine. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> now that I'm a short timer, I, I feel a bit more brave in <laughs> raising these issues to uh, uh, senior decision makers. And, uh, and it's all well and good, but 90% of all the money we're spending right now on uh, bird flu is on the old uh, we want to build up a stockpile full, full of uh, cures and vaccines and uh, other uh, things which will save lives against a bird flu, SARS, etc. With very, very minuscule amount of funding uh, to what I personally uh, find much more important in a situation where we can't do anything about an attack. Uh, I'm very, very coming from CDC. Uh, 
you know, we call our young uh, doctors and nurses who join CDC epidemic intelligence service officers. That's what uh, Scott was when we first brought him to CDC. We've got no medical intelligence. Uh, uh, we don't know uh, where SARS or a new strain of influenza is popping up. Is it in China? Is it in Kazakhstan? Uh, is it going to be in uh, South America? Uh, mo most of these diseases do begin in, uh, in China, in that part, Thailand, Vietnam. Uh, we don't know its movement uh, geographically. We don't know if it's changing in its ability to kill people. Uh, uh, the reason why we have to have a flu vaccine every year is its uh, genetic uh, coding uh, basically changes. Is this changing as it moves towards the United States? Is it getting uh, a, a greater ability to kill people? Or is it uh, not going to be that harmful? But we don't know that unless we have medical intelligence. Uh, and as I might have said before, it's like Pearl Harbor without, uh, you know, we're building uh, battleships and, and, uh, and uh, uh, carriers, but we don't know who's attacking, when's the attack going to occur, uh, uh, and uh, uh, where it's going to be. And unless we have good situational awareness, medical intelligence, we really can't have an early alert. Uh, we have very, very poor geographical global monitoring. Where do we get that information from? It takes cooperation with the 190 member states of WHO. We have not the best relationship with the World Health Organization or any of the uh, UN agencies. We're depending on uh, the uh, uh, ability and uh, uh, the uh, willingness of countries to supply data on outbreaks of uh, avian influenza, quarantine, isolation, and another area where uh, people weren't too happy with me, non-medical countermeasures, which uh, uh, Dr. Cassells mentioned. If you don't have a cure, if you don't have a vaccine, uh, basically we're going to have to go back to the highly effective measures that uh, were the cornerstone of public health, which uh, basically eradicated mo most of the diseases which were the big killers in the 19th century. Uh, uh, washing your hands, uh, separating people. We might have to do shifts of workers, uh, shifts of schools. I went to the uh, Federal Emergency Management Training Center, dug up books from the 1950s on the old civil defense nuclear uh, war preparedness uh, with uh, the Soviet Union, and a lot of those uh, uh, very nicely uh, outlined uh, uh, measures uh, we've forgotten. Uh, I mean, we talk about forgetting the lessons of history. Well, a lot of these were done 100 years ago and were done uh, as uh, late as the uh, early 60s when we were still very much in a nuclear contact, contest with the Soviet Union. I won't go through this in much detail. These are just some of the uh, reasons why early detection is, uh, is so important because if you can, the earlier you detect a disease, the earlier you're able to make uh, medical interventions and, uh, and save lives. Uh, if, you, if you don't uh, detect them very early, uh, like here, you have uh, less chance of control. Detect early, you have greater potential cases uh, 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 prevented. But uh, once again, uh, Scott, my job as an epidemiologist doesn't look as glamorous as search and rescue teams and, and doctors flowing into uh, a uh, emergency affected site. Most of what we do is uh, collecting data, entering it into a computer. Uh, we've got to basically uh, go back to uh, what we did back in the 1920s. We both worked for the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, places like Ellis Island, uh, uh, the influx of immigrants, uh, 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 examining, examining patients. I, 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 I've, I've talked now to the Department of Transportation, the FAA. I mean, these are agencies which you know, they, they said, what do, we, what do we have to do with health? Well, you know, I see uh, charter planes flying directly from Shanghai to Chicago, unloading 300 tourists. They're through Immigration and Customs in about five seconds. 
and onto the tour, tour buses. Uh, what do we have to do to screen um, um, potential carriers of SARS? Uh, I can tell you what we did two years ago, taking their temperature. <laughs> that was it. Uh, they might have had a, a bit too many more martinis than they should have, and uh, the temperature goes up, and they get pushed off to the side. It goes, uh, down. It goes down with martinis. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. I should have chosen, uh, what about uh, tequila? Uh, the key uh, research area. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, you know, you might say, my God, this is pretty, pretty primitive. Uh, this is... Uh, from China, uh, uh, public health measures from the 1920s. Uh, this is the last staff meeting I, I went to at the CDC, uh, Dr. Gerberding, and uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> that's that's from uh, advertisement for. Uh, <laughs> but I can do that since she won't be my boss. <laughs> uh, but we've got to go back just basic uh, epidemiology. Uh, other challenges are. Uh, and how can we provide uh, medical care in, uh, in areas? These are areas where diseases are popping up, uh, you know, dressed uh, like, like the military. And uh, uh, this is in uh, Iraq, and having to go around as a doctor where uh, these were the types of garbs that uh, people who were committing atrocities uh, against the population were dressed as. Uh, how do we provide that same sort of care and provide security to our health care uh, workers? Uh, I participated in, uh, co-authored this article, the role of the applied epidemiologists in armed conflict. And uh, these are the places where diseases are, po Ebola virus, uh, plague, uh, tularemia, uh, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Unfortunately, they're in places uh, which are not safe uh, anymore. Uh, and, and I know people who are scholars here are much more familiar with the, the situation, but it's in these failed states like Somalia, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, formerly Mozambique, Angola. Angola, we had a major outbreak of Marburg virus, just as virulent as, a, as Ebola virus. Uh, we should be having uh, sentinel sites. Uh, uh, we, we presented a uh, proposal to develop a NORAD-like uh, center uh, for infectious disease threats. Uh, some of you may not realize, but NORAD was for detecting uh, missiles uh, coming over from the Soviet Union. But this requires uh, global partnerships with our partners, uh, uh, with WHO. With, uh, with the other, with the military. We have very poor cooperation uh, between HHS uh, and the military. Uh, Non-governmental organizations. Uh, most uh, WHO offices aren't even connected by uh, electronic uh, communication. How can we uh, rapidly uh, communicate an outbreak of Ebola virus or a flu if we don't even have uh, faxes, if we don't even have uh, 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 email. Uh, this is a mess. I don't want to get into it. Uh, uh, just the uh, agencies involved in, I call it the fog of response. And uh, the same thing happened with uh, Katrina. Uh, we've got a new agency involved in Homeland Security, uh, but uh, uh, knowing how to work uh, with them at the city, county, state level. Uh, Scott and I realized, this is the scene that greeted Scott and I every day coming to work. Uh, 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 Scott That's mentioned his pile of uh, sugar uh, coating in, in his inbox. Uh, fortunately, one of those uh, uh, alligators was Dr. Cassell's, and it, uh, it turned out to uh, uh, Scott's uh, uh, favor. Uh, uh, once again, each of these organizations, we've got to develop a much better uh, uh, working relationship with, since they've also have a big uh, vested interest, uh, G7 uh, plus the Mexican Ministers of Health. There's all these meetings go on, which uh, uh, I usually find out about secondhand. Uh, State Department has their own uh, a, uh, bird flu plans. Uh, uh, the EU uh, uh, ha has their plans, which uh, sometimes don't have an American representative. I mentioned the good things we learned from Athens uh, 2004. WHO now has been granted new powers uh, to investigate uh, these outbreaks in countries. 
But once again, it uh, depends on the cooperation of these countries, uh, and it's not a be-all and uh, an end-all. Uh, so I think I'm going to end my uh, presentation right now and leave the rest of the time for questions, but uh, uh, we did have an opportunity, uh, which I worked on at WHO, where I was uh, detailed. This was when uh, the negotiations for the uh, Biological Weapons Convention were ongoing. WHO is trying to use this as a mechanism for identifying outbreaks uh, of virulent naturally occurring diseases using the uh, uh, Biological Weapons Convention so that was signed in uh, 1972. So these are just some of the challenges that we, uh, we face. International or health organizations are underfunded. We've got uh, poor uh, cooperation from many of the developed countries, developing countries where some of these epidemics are uh, 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 starting. And finally, I'd like to end up uh, with uh, the agency that Scott and I worked with for so many years. People think of uh, CDC, you know, dealing with ship-borne uh, cruise ship outbreaks of diarrhea. They don't realize that CDC was established as an agency for biodefense. Alexander Langmuir, uh, founder of the CDC EIS program, 1952, heart of the uh, Cold War. The detection and control of saboteurs are the responsibilities of the FBI, but the recognition of epidemics caused by sabotage, or I might add naturally occurring diseases, is particularly an epidemiologic function. Therefore, any plan of defense against biological warfare sabotage requires trained epidemiologists alert to all possibilities and available for a call at a moment's notice anywhere uh, in the country. So basically, if it wasn't for biological warfare, we wouldn't have a CDC. Uh, that's the, this was a testimony in front of Congress by Dr. Langmuir. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, we'll have Thank you, Eric. Uh, time for questions. Uh, again, flanked by two visionaries, we have uh, about three minutes for questions. Um, yes, sir. Uh, thanks. Great presentation, guys. Uh, could you talk about the current status of SARS? Uh, we haven't heard much about the SARS outbreak in a couple of years. And what is the status of the investigations into the 2001 anthrax outbreaks? I guess I better handle those two. Um, SARS disappeared as quickly as it came. It's an example of an emerging disease that takes its toll and uh, for which we were, uh, came unexpected and uh, challenged our readiness. It was a test. Uh, only about 800 people died that we know of, uh, but it uh, took its toll on the economy, the transportation, the hotel industry, and uh, at least uh, 11 nations uh, felt uh, the brunt of uh, SARS. A lot of people think we dodged a bullet because it, as the epidemic began to ebb, the first couple of cases or suspects in the United States began to arrive. No further cases, uh, still a mystery. The anthrax uh, of 2001, uh, there has not been anybody to my knowledge, charged uh, at this time, and the, the case has not been solved. So it, it belies the fact that the lack of um, attribution is a key feature in bioterrorism. It's very easy to escape and evade. And uh, without great surveillance, without an exuberant public health capacity, without the ability to detect those early cases, you're going to be playing catch up, uh, both in the press and in the clinical world when it comes to biodefense. Yes, sir. I was much taken by your comments about uh, the reliance on 19th century medicine and the fact that we really have to rely on the private sector. Uh, and it seems that the, uh, the marshalling of the enormous capability we have scientifically and technologically is only going to come with government leadership. So can you tell us something about what the government may do to marshal resources for screening tools, for antivirals? Well, for Dr. Vaccines? Skolnick, uh, the, the uh, the uh, bill to put um, eight billion or so into pandemic flu would passed in the Senate, but not in the House. They're going to take it up again in the next few weeks. But uh, and, and of course, you're developing uh, a novel kind of antiviral, in this, a novel kind of DNA-based vaccine. And these DNA vaccines are going to be terribly important. Cell culture-based vaccines novel vaccine designs like Michael Deem is developing here at Rice, for example, 
they're all terribly important. But meantime, the take home message for my patients and for you is uh, you know, wash your hands, sneeze into your left sleeve, have masks at home. Uh, they're cheap, they're not very effective, yeah. but they're better than nothing. Get the regular flu shot, get the regular pneumonia vaccine if you haven't had it. Have some antibiotic at the house because if you can't reach your doctor because your doctor's overwhelmed or given up or Sick. split the country or, <laughs> or dead, uh, you better have some antibiotics in your house. And I totally reject the government uh, advice against hoarding. My patients are well stocked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, we have time for two more questions. In uh, Vietnam, like in the Delta or I Corps, what are the estimates, the percentage of the poultry that have avian flu? Is it 10 percent, 90 percent? Well, some communities have had, you know, 50 percent antibody exposure in the poultry, but most of them uh, in, in the well run. Uh, countries like Bangkok and uh, in Thailand, uh, the commercial uh, poultry is uh, less than one in a thousand now have, have antibodies against H5N1. But uh, uh, in the backyard farms in, in Vietnam and China and, and, and particularly Cambodia and Laos, Burma, where they don't have any, any funds for public health, we don't, we don't know, they don't want to know, they can't afford to know, and the estimates <coughs> Estimates from people who uh, snuck in there and done some surveys are frighteningly high. And of course, the big, the big international issue is, is China uh, finally reporting all their cases, or as the uh, dissident press in China says, have there really been 100 deaths from bird flu and 1,000 cases? And uh, it's very controversial in China. We just don't know exactly what's happening. We hope that they've learned the lessons from SARS and that they're welcoming the uh, international, w welcoming the World Health uh, visitors. Uh, Lily, do you have some answer? Yes, for you, <laughs> or maybe for Paul. I just read, recently read the Chinese newspaper. They say some doctor in China, they, they figured out the SARS, the drugs can cure the, the bird flu. But I don't know if that's true. The medicine can, they already have the medicine for the SARS. So the SARS, that kind of medicine can cure the bird flu. Uh, there's been some uh, new research suggesting that um, increased uh, efficiency of certain drug classes that uh, have cross-reactivity to SARS and other viral agents. So um, uh, hopefully a good piece of news one day. Uh, one final question. Let me just uh, ask who, I think you had your hand up first. Um, I was just thinking about how long it takes to get new treatments, new vaccines, uh, new drugs into the pipeline. People will have and money. we have like <laughs> two years or three years. Yeah. And is there any thought to increasing <coughs> the ability of these new technologies to get into people instead of rats and monkeys? You, know? you want me to, you guys want to? Yes, well, we have, we're, the bills in Congress today call for uh, a number of procedures like developing the vaccines in, uh, making the vaccines in cell culture, for example. And uh, the FDA under our Houston's own leader, Andy Von Eschenbach, has pledged to fast track, uh, fast track them. We're looking at uh, the use of haptins, which are uh, little conjugates that help you stretch the vaccine supply, because right now we have enough uh, you know, even if, if even if the, the 2.7 million doses that the government has in stock for H5N1, even if they work, uh, that only covers it covers less than one percent of our population, and uh, of course, it could be mayhem as people line up. Uh, you, you almost, you, from, a, from a, a public order po point of view, you might wish that you didn't have any, rather than to have enough for 1% because of the uh, threat to the public security there. It, uh, we're working on it. I hope I'm never in a position to say I told you so. I've been, uh, you know, fussing about this for six years now, and I hope that, uh, I'll tell you one thing, if we get the vaccine and uh, we get these chickens uh, culled and, all, and the chicken vaccines work, uh, I'm going to take full credit for the whole thing. <laughs> okay. I'm not giving these guys any credit for it. That'll be fine. Well, let me bring this to, that'll be, you, you can have all my credit. Uh, 
let me bring this to a close, and I'll tell you three things that I've, I've heard tonight. Uh, one is that uh, these were uh, wonderfully gift gifted speakers. I'm uh, flanked by two uh, visionaries, particularly in looking at health into the future and health in the past and trying to figure out where we might need to go. It looks like we have both technical impediments in medicine and vaccine and medications. We have political impediments working with transparency across borders, and we have industrial and business impediments about uh, the manufacturing and supply of critical components to put together in a leadership model that will give us the kind of safety we need as a nation. I think these kind of people, these two people, are the kind of people that will do that. The Baker Institute is the kind of place where it comes together. And I am so pleased to be here and draw this to a close. I invite all of you to give yourself an applause and come down and speak with our speakers. Thank you.